Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. This afternoon, we have episode 32, Lettering, Fonts, and Ambigrams. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. It is a little late. It is a little bit later than I would have liked it to be. 2.35 p.m. in the mountain time zone here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I do apologize for the delay. Had a little bit of a network issue, but we are back up and running. And I am on copper. If you don't know what I mean by that, I am plugged into the wall. Uh, apparently, my uh, other half of my copper was unplugged. And I'm having some Wi-Fi issues, but we are back on. Everything's working and we are ready to go with lettering, right? What are we talking about today? We're talking about lettering. We're talking about fonts. We're talking about ambigrams. And I know everybody probably wants to get over to the ambigram side of it, the fun part. I'm going to cover some stuff we've covered before because lots of people have issues with fonts, right? They have issues with creating uh, text with getting lettering the way they want it to look. So we're going to have some stuff that we cover that is uh, maybe old hat, maybe the kind of stuff you've done before, maybe stuff that I've taught before, but we're also going to be covering things that are new and interesting and discussing uh, to a degree also the differences between things like lettering and fonts, right? Uh, there are some definite differences and I want to talk to you about that. So first things first, usually this starts at 2.30, so I will say, uh, Hey, uh, you have not watched this live before. Has it started yet? You're not in the right place, right time. You were at the right place, the right time, and I wasn't, and I apologize. But we are back here now. And we are on for the next hour and probably some minutes of bonus time. Uh, but don't worry, anybody. If you come here and something's wrong, something goes on, it is recorded. It goes up on YouTube, goes up on Facebook, and stays there in perpetuity. So come back, watch the replays, and still leave comments. People leave comments because leaving comments, uh, I will get to check those later. The rest of the people who are in here, the Take Up crew who like to watch this stuff, will be coming back and comment. And I am very happy to have you guys talk about it. So jump on in. Aaron's in here. Hello, Aaron. Jeff Fuller, excited to see some ambigrams. Yeah, we'll we'll show a few of those and I'll definitely talk about what they are and my process for them. Uh, like I said, I'll have to see how, how much of each kind of topic we cover today, but I will get to the ambigrams because I know everybody was excited to do that. It's a little less embroidery related, so I don't like to do just the design part of that stuff, but I will talk about that as we get going. So let's go for, let's get going for that. Then uh, Donna Scott Johnson, hey, happy to see you here. Looking forward to today's episode. I'm looking forward to have you here. Uh, Just is here. Happy to see you here, sir. Uh, all the way from Sweden. Uh, Christine says, uh, good afternoon, Eric. Hope we get some relaxation this holiday weekend. I have a lot on tap to do. I think relaxation may not be <laughs> may not be on the menu, but hey, that's all right, folks. Uh, Ramona says, small, small, small text. You know what? I will go ahead and cover a little bit of that, but that's one of those things where we might have an entire episode dedicated to tiny, tiny text at some point. Uh, small text, I'm going to give some general rules and some things that I like to do to uh, make text the way it should be. because so we're gonna talk about what the considerations are for all text as far as sizing things like that. Uh, Frank Dunn is in. Frank from over in the UK. Good evening to you, Frank. Thank you for joining. Uh, Sylvia is in. Uh, soon you'll be here early. Well, you know what? I certainly was here late, so you had a good chance of catching me this time. Uh, Aaron says, bonus time. Yeah, I, I perceive there'll be some bonus time. I, I think that's probably gonna happen today. Uh, Matthew says, uh, it's real late in Greece and you'll have to get some sleep. You know what? Get some sleep, catch it on the flip side and like an ambigram, we we'll catch you on the flip, sir. <laughs> uh, Carolyn says, comment, comment, comment. Glad to see you today. Glad to see you too, Carolyn. You are one of my faves. Uh, Regina says, good to see you, Eric. Oh, Regina, happy to see you too. If you guys had not seen years ago, uh, my first foray out of being just a in-house digitizer in a shop was to go out with uh, Regina and do a do kind of a, a guide where we talked about all the different stuff and did a consultation and got to stay with her shop. So it was really cool to see Regina. Good to see you here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, ambigrams for us, please. Yes. Uh, Tina means, hello, ready to learn to digitize? We'll talk about that for sure. We're going to talk about digitizing concerns a lot today because that's really what I do. That's my thing. Uh, Nadine says, hello. Happy to have you here, Nadine. And Jeff says, part one, part two, part three. I don't know how many years the take-up will go on. There is room for all the parts, my friends. There's room for as many parts as we have. And let me tell you this. When we're talking about lettering, uh, it's very easy for me to just say that, hey, Lettering is always a concern. I have taught every manner of different lettering concern over and over. Certainly tiny text. Uh, you know, Ramona asked about tiny text. How many times I have taught the limits of tiny text? I cannot tell you. Uh, tiny text, straight stitch text, 
what do you do with different kinds of fonts? How do you edit fonts to make them work out when you're not digitizing? How do you make larger fonts more durable? All of these things can get covered. And like I said, we're definitely going to have to talk about these things. Uh, unfortunately, I lost a little bit of my setup today when I had a little uh, issue with the internet and had to restart here. But uh, let's go ahead and get started because we're going to talk about the first thing, which is, and I'm actually literally typing up a little banner so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, this is my thing that I want to discuss, uh, lettering versus fonts. Lettering versus fonts. And here's the thing. We talk about lettering, we talk about fonts, and people kind of discuss these in the same breath as if they were the same thing, right? We talk about lettering in general when we're talking about embroidery, mostly because what we do when we're digitizing, and this is mostly, and I'm going to say people who do a unique digitizing, most of the time, we are trying to do lettering. We're doing something that is temporary, that is meant to be used for one specific design at one specific size. When we're talking about a logo type, lettering that's part of a logo, part of a design, most of the time what we're doing is lettering. Now, when we talk about this in a design context, we're talking about the design that we're starting from, the art we're starting from, the logo we're starting from, the difference that I'm talking about with lettering versus fonts, and I'm actually gonna say lettering versus typeface as well, is that lettering can be like hand lettering, can be bespoke, done specifically for a word, for a logo type, and it does not exist as a full set of characters, or it has been altered from a standard typeface, from a standard set of characters, and is not just a font, is not just a single typeface. So instead of being let's say Helvetica, why not, very popular, uh, you have something that is bespoke. Somebody has lettered something by hand. And actually, I just got a book, and I can't wait to dig into it, um, House Industries. If you don't know House Industries, they make incredible typefaces, and they do hand lettering. That's a guide that I'm going to read for my own experiences in lettering, because I like to do lettering in fonts myself. Uh, but in that, it talks about hand lettering. If you haven't looked up the immense number of videos on hand lettering, go look up some stuff on YouTube and watch people do hand lettering. Uh, if you've been around a while or seen people doing this, say in a downtown area, sign painting is one of the things that's very easy to kind of get it through people's heads of what I'm talking about, talking about lettering. You can do lettering, you can draw letters, draw glyphs, shapes that are letters, without them being part of a typeface, without them being part of a font. And frequently when I'm talking to people about embroidery and about logos, invariably somebody is trying to find a font. And if you go back, there's actually another episode of The Take Up where I talk about finding digital assets, where I'm talking about finding fonts and how you do it and why you may not want to do it because it takes an immense amount of time. But the thing I see people spending tons and tons of time on is trying to find a font when what they really have is lettering. And honestly, even if you have something in embroidery design that is from a typeface, quite frequently, if you're digitizing yourself, if you're drawing any shapes yourself, and I think you should be, most people should be able to do at least light amounts of lettering work. Anybody who wants to digitize anything, I think it's a good place to start. It's a nice single color thing. It gets you controlling your satin stitches very well. People invariably are looking for a font to replicate something where you have three, four, five, six characters, you don't necessarily need a font to type it out unless there is something wrong with the art, unless you have to change something in the word, you're missing a letter that you don't have. Then even when we have a typeface, we don't really need to have a font, especially an embroidered font to make that happen. We're just gonna wanna draw those characters. The thing is when you have lettering, proper lettering, that's something that's either been done by hand or if it's a logo type that's been altered from a typeface, there's not going to be a font. There is no font for certain things. And the funny thing is people get very confused because what's happened with incredibly popular brands is that designers who really like the brand or people who are fans of said brand might take a lettering object, a logo type that has a specific set of letters and try and abstract an entire font where they draw all the rest of the letters based on the style of the letters that are in that logo type. And there are certainly logo types where people have used a, an existing typeface in them. And so you can say, you can look up the font for a certain logo. The thing is, there's a high chance, especially when you see something idiosyncratic where it doesn't look like a typeface, where there's something weird about it. You have one letter that's really strange. There's a good chance that it's been altered or that it is hand lettering of some kind, or at least altered lettering and isn't a font at all. So the first thing I want to do before we talk about anything else is to define that, right? Lettering can be any sort of hand-drawn glyphs or any sort of glyphs that are not part of a typeface necessarily or have been altered from a typeface. That's what I'm saying. When I say lettering, that's what I'm talking about. And most of what we do in embroidery, if we are digitizing logos, because also number two thing, don't replace logo types, stuff that's in a logo with a generic font that's close enough. 
Treat the logo correctly. Make sure that the lettering looks exactly like it should, unless there is a really good reason. Uh, usually, it's not a font you have in your system. If you have a few characters for the name of a business, draw them out, break them up into shapes and draw them out. That's lettering versus fonts. I really just wanted to make sure that I define that for you guys. When we're digitizing, a lot of the time, what we really want to do is actually digitize the individual characters in the letter and not just go to trying to find a font. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go back to, it's an article that I've shared before with you guys, but I'm going to go ahead and share it again because I think it is useful. And I guess here we go again, Images Magazine out in the UK getting some uh, free advertising from me because uh, I happen to be the person who's publishing this stuff in there. And I had this article that I did called as easy as ABC. And I really kind of cover some of the generic stuff that we can, that we're going to cover here a little bit, but I just want to go through a couple things that are in this just to make sure it's clear. It's like this right here, this particular piece, Karen Kuhn photography. It's one of the pieces I show pretty frequently because it has some very small lettering in it. You'll see the uh, link to this in the comments. If you're not watching this live, uh, go back into the comments, you'll get it, but I should be able to put it in the description later. Um, Karen Kuhn photography that you're seeing on screen right now, this is not a font. This particular piece was hand lettered. When this art was brought to me, it was an oil painting. So this was an oil painting that was brought to me on canvas that I had to then uh, take a nice flat photograph of and scan and deal with and work from that type. The Ks are different. Dead giveaway when you have multiple different characters uh, that are very different, it's a good likelihood you've got something like this. The thing I will say though, is with the advent of open type fonts, you guys know the difference between true type and open type? Well, true type fonts and open type fonts, two different ways to use fonts in your computer. These are both vector objects, fonts you can use in design software. Open type fonts often have alternate glyphs, stylistic alternate glyphs, meaning that they may have two styles of a K or an A or an R. So these days it's a little harder to tell if you've got lettering versus a font, but frequently, um, yeah, <laughs> frequently, you will notice that you've got multiple different shapes for the same letter, and that's a good chance you've got lettering and you shouldn't be looking for a font. But this particular piece, pretty easy for me to tell you, it was not a font, it was brought in on an oil painting, I had to scan it and work from that. The thing is, this is lettering, this is hand lettering properly, so I'm going to be drawing all these shapes, no need to look for a font. And that's the first thing to kind of get through, is that that is part of what it is. Now this one has a lot of characters, certainly, but look, I've got a lot of repeated stuff, Thing is, I'm not gonna be able to reuse it because when, it, when you're doing hand lettering, one of the things I always teach people is, hey, copy and paste. When you're doing any kind of lettering that is based on a typeface, copy and paste everything you can because it, 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 if you get it clean the first time on the first glyph, the second copy is going to look uniform. It's gonna look like the other glyphs that are there. And when you keep on copying and pasting elements that you can, in fact, I believe I've got that shown here. If I don't have it shown here, I'm gonna show you something else that does have it. Um, you copy and paste elements and you get more internal consistency. And so let me, let me kind of pull back so you can see me talking here. Uh, internal consistency meaning if I have a K and I'm gonna have another K and it's the same K from, that is from a typeface, even if I don't have a font or I'm not looking it up, I digitize the first K and get it nice and clean. I copy that and paste it into the second position because that internal consistency is something that we pick up with on type. People are very, very sensitive to type being straight and legible and clean. So type is something that we should focus on more in uh, embroidery. Why do I have like three episodes on typography? It's because lettering and typography is important. And we have to remember that what we're doing is trying to help people promote things and we're helping them to communicate. No one wants their name messed up. No one wants the name of their business to look bad. You have to be able to communicate clearly and text is how we do that with embroidery designs. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but let's go ahead and just, just look at this one more time. This is something I've shown you before, but I think it bears saying again, when you are digitizing fonts, too many people will grab a true type font, grab the vector out of it, type it out, and we'll either use auto conversion in some software or they'll use some sort of automatic satin stitching. And truthfully, though it does its best, there are telltale signs that when you've done that, that it doesn't look all that great. The cornering isn't great. It does weird things at the junctions and it's not the best. And what I want you guys to think about is breaking up those shapes and letters into individual strokes. And this is something that's really easy to show you here. I like to show this image. I've shown it several times. The top is actually an example from a calligrapher of the same type of type, the same typeface, the same type of glyphs that we're seeing on the bottom in embroidery. And you can see that they're made of individual pen strokes. Think of your letter in satin stitches very much like these pen strokes. You should have individual satin blocks. These are not one shape that's necessarily, you know, using break lines or anything else. These are usually done in individual shapes. As you can see down here in the bottom, 
in this A, we have one shape for this tail, we have one for the stroke, we have a stroke here on the left leg, and the right leg has a stroke. And as you can see up in the top, we've done some work to try and make these join a certain way, these corners. Uh, the B here is made up of five strokes. We've got a little tiny one up at the top here. We have another satin stitch stroke here, one on the top curve, one on the bottom curve. The C is a single stroke, but you can still see how we are using a satin stitch that is following rotationally along that pathway. We're not just using a fill object. When people very first start digitizing, they often want to grab an object, we have a vector, slap a start and an end point on it in an inclination line, and then that's what they do. They fill it with stitches or use some sort of automation. It usually doesn't look very good. So that's something I know that's something I've covered before in other topics, but definitely want to cover it again. And here's one of the uh, images I'd like to show you guys. Uh, these are automatic conversions, and you can see very distinctly uh, kind of the logic that's behind the automation process and how it kind of fails us when we don't make those choices for ourselves. Like I always say, I think automation does have a place. Automation for me fails when it makes our creative decisions for us, and I do consider that the way that we put a letter to, together to be a creative decision. If you look at the top of this M, uh, if we're, it was next to another letter in this set, say the I was next to it in this same font, it would have the ends, the openings of the sentence, which is on the top and bottom, but on the M, for some reason, we're cornering here and we're breaking this loose. As you can see, even in the preview, but with compensation on it, we've got some roughness here, some roughness in the top here, that where we're not going to have these lines line up. The middle of this K, this is another really classic one, and you'll see this on uppercase like black and bold Bs all the time. If you if you want to know if someone auto converted a font that you're purchasing, like let's say you're purchasing a font for your embroidery software and you want to know if it's auto converted, look for this kind of stuff where there's two points between that are on the outside edge and you can see that there's a cut or a carving line between them. It looks like they're broken together in a weird way. They've been broken apart Instead of having this stroke that we can see, you and I can see from top to bottom that this is one object, this left hand spine of the letter, it cuts out to this point because it's trying to find where to break that up automatically. Auto digitizing looks poor and it often ends up having some unevenness as you can see in the M here. And trust me in this K, there would be a little bit pulling apart here in this bottom junction because we don't have good overlapping because we also have broken up our strokes in a weird way. And that's not what we wanna see. Uh, same thing that happens here. Sometimes in auto conversions, what you're gonna find, instead of overlapping, that this is a straight cut. Even when it does it in a way that looks pretty normal, there's often a cut right here where this, even with compensation uh, on the top of this M and the bottom of this M, these are cut lines where those objects just kiss together at the edge. And as we know, satin stitches are gonna get a little narrower as they run, they're gonna pull apart, you're gonna get gaps, it's gonna look awful. Also, you have inconsistencies. If you look here on this S on the right-hand side, we've got the open end matching flat angles to the end of that stroke that we would expect from an S. On the upper right-hand side, the automation has failed us again and in the end looks super awful. As you can see, it is starting to tail off here and what's going to happen, of course, uh, on that top of that S, that's going to get shorter because the satin stitch is gonna pull and because it's going to push toward the open end of the satin stitch, it's going to push out longer. We're gonna get a weird little corner. The front of that S, that top kind of curve of the S will push out to a point and look pretty awful. So these are the kind of things we have to look for for automation that doesn't serve us. What we really wanna do is be able to uh, bring in, even if we're using our a true type font to get our original art, we wanna bring it in and do what we sh I showed you up here which is break it up into our own strokes so that we can make the overlaps we want to, make the corners we want to. And that's something I will go ahead and talk again. Like I said, this is something that I've covered in detail, so I'm not gonna go too far on it, but let's just go ahead and jump briefly into it. Uh, like I said, cornering is another thing we'll discuss, but you can do a number of corners, and I actually have a, another presentation I'll probably show you a couple of slides from, where we have the ability to either cap or we can overlap, or we can miter. There are multiple different ways we do corners. The thing is, a lot of people will look at me and say, okay, well, what setting do I click to get corners? And I'm going to kind of uh, say that I would like to impart on you what these corners are so that you can draw the objects you need to make them yourself. I think they're much better when we can tune them ourselves and we don't rely on cornering protocols to do it. We actually make the overlaps we need, we make the shapes we need to get the kind of corners, the kind of overlaps, the kind of junctions that we want. Uh, and like I said, this kind of stuff, I just, I'm not very fond of the way that that turned out. But with that, I'd like to go ahead and jump out just for a second and take a couple of the comments that we have here. Cause I think that is, it's always valuable. I like to have you guys in and uh, 
frankly, <laughs> I'm with Ramon on this. I've always had a dislike for the phrase good enough sigh. I will share that sigh for you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Good enough is not good enough. When we're talking about somebody's logo type, you definitely want to digitize the characters yourself. You don't want to match it with the font unless the font is identical. Or you can edit characters perhaps if they've been edited from a typeface. But good enough often looks amateurish. And this is what I'll say. I I've said it before. I will say it again. When you use a good enough match font, what usually ends up happening is that the, the design of the logo looks like a knockoff. It looks like if you went to the dollar store and you picked up a version of the person's logo that wasn't quite the logo you were looking for, but it looked kind of like it, it was trying to pass itself off as that logo, that's what we look like. We don't look authentic if we don't use the right typefaces. So that's something I would say I want to kind of get through and say, you know, maybe not the best option, maybe not the thing you want to do. I, I, at least personally, I'm not very fond of that of that look. So let's go ahead and jump out. Since Ramona, you asked about tiny text again, I'm gonna share something. Once again, some of you guys is gonna be old hat. I'm sorry if it's old hat, trust me, we're gonna get some more fun stuff later. The ambigrams are still on tap. I've got examples to show you and everything. But small text is something that everybody comes across and has issues with. I'm gonna define just a couple things again, like I often do. And this is something that everybody has seen before. If you've been around me for any period of time, but it's something that I think is worth saying. Uh, and this is the deal. When we're talking about either lettering or typefaces or fonts, the thing is scale makes a difference. Scale makes a huge difference to how things turn out. We know in embroidery, because we have a known value, what's our known value? The known value for us is the, the thickness of our thread. The thickness of our thread is our known value. And we understand thickness of our thread, the size of our needle as that known value doesn't change. When we scale a design up, when we scale a design down, that's how we end up dealing with those sizes. We have to deal with what the minimum that's possible is and what the maximum that's possible is, and we have to deal with that, right? So here's the first thing. I'm just gonna show you a couple of figures. If you guys don't know, this is how we kind of set where that is. The first thing I wanna let you know is that this is based on 40 weight thread, right? You see that? When is text too small? And I'm gonna talk about small safe text. Why do we say safe? Well, here's the deal. I'm gonna tell you five millimeters tall is the smallest safe text for 48 thread with say a 7511 needle. You can go smaller, but that's usually what I'm using for the most general needle I'll use on most projects is a 7511. It's not the only needle you can use. Smaller is finer, you can do that for sure. And especially when you go to smaller thread, you'll need one. But 7511 is what I usually run for most of my projects in general. If, I, if I'm talking about my middle base, that's where it is. So for, for that, I'm gonna say it's five millimeters, but the reason I call it safe text is if you look back at that example I showed you of, uh, the Karen Kuhn logo, I've got letters that are under three millimeters in there in 48 thread. The thing is, they still have some of the other properties that I'm gonna talk about in a second. And safe text, safe text is about what is the safe limit that we're not pushing it, where a little difference in fabric is not gonna necessarily wreck something, that's safe text. Now I know Ramona says here, which she's a tiny text under five millimeters. We'll talk about under five millimeter text. Number one thing is certainly thinner thread because that's our, our known that is our known value. That's the thing we can do about it. But also straight stitch text. Using straight stitch text is incredibly useful and I like to use it quite a bit. But first, let's go ahead and cover this. For the people who don't know, who haven't really done a lot of digitizing, smallest reliable text, this is why we talk about smallest reliable text. And this is whether it's a font, whether it is a lettering piece that we're digitizing ourselves. We know that we can reliably get a stitch or a satin stitch to hold up at about one millimeter thickness. 0.8 to one millimeter, 1.2 is what you often wanna see with some compensation on it. We'll run on most materials safely. And if we have a stack of those with our smallest reliable gap, which is 0.8 to, point to one millimeter, once again, we're talking about satin stitches, between those where we have some, we have a little bit of daylight between them that we can see, that we're not concerned about, we know that we're gonna be able to see that hole and it won't close up or tear an eyelet in our material. Well, then we have a stack that makes five millimeters, right? But that's, four, that's 40 weight thread. The thing is, we can go smaller with smaller needles and smaller thread. Why does that work? Well, we have different values we're working with. We're working with smaller needles, smaller thread, we're punching smaller holes certainly, and our compensation is a little different. It means that we aren't stacking up that same thickness of thread, and that's why we don't get the same kind of push, the same kind of pull is a little different as well, because that tension, that lash is different. But here's the thing, five millimeters, really good and safe. Uh, and if you guys don't know, one inch is 25.4 millimeters. So about a, you know, 0.2 of an inch, good safe text on 40 weight thread. You talk about smaller text. One of the things we can do, like I said, you get smaller, 
And here's the deal. Why is this safe still? Or why does this still work despite the fact that it's smaller? Well, one of the reasons is that I have nice open counters. The counter is the hole inside the letter, like the hole inside the O and the P there. Those are open. They are at least 0.8 millimeters open. If they are not 0.8 millimeters, the likelihood is they're not going to stay open when they run. And so these safe sizes work even with smaller letters. When I say five millimeters, I'm talking about the smallest character that has that stack of five gaps. As you see, that has two gaps in it, not one. If this was an O, I can go down to three millimeters with no problem. I only have one hole and two rows of satin stitching I gotta worry about in that stack, right? And here's the thing, 60 weight thread, the reason we can get smaller is it's thinner. And the, it's approximate here, it's about 25% thinner. Could be a little bit more than that, but it runs about that way fairly universally. If your garment allows you don't have a ton of texture and you can use something to stabilize the top of that texture, water soluble toppings, one of the ways we do that. If you don't have things falling into texture on the material that it has say like gaps or basket weave or piquet or some sort of uh, divots that are larger than that, you can run 25% smaller. So we can definitely get down to four and three millimeter text with 60 weight thread. And there are 75 weight threads. There is even thinner thread you can use. You just have to watch out for that needle and deflection. So once again, smaller needle, smaller thread. The thing is most people look at that and they say, okay, something's not looking quite right. I'm gonna run it with that 60 weight thread. What you need to realize is you may end up, if it's a little sparse looking, you need more density because we've changed the thickness of the thread and density is a measurement of space between threads. If we make those threads thinner, it essentially increases the space between them. So we get sparser coverage with thinner thread. That's pretty easy, right? So that's why we can get smaller with 60 weight thread because of that known value is smaller. And here's the thing, when we're working on fonts, and when we work on fonts for embroidery software, let's say you're making fonts, the thing you have to realize is we can't necessarily do the same kind of compensation that we would do for lettering. And that's something we're gonna get into a little bit later. But we have to realize that the scale is part of this because we have this known value. Whether I'm doing tiny, tiny three millimeter text or I'm doing inch and a half text, no matter what, unless I change the needle and I change the thread, I still have some of the issues that I would usually have. So certainly, like I said, Rowena says she's talking about uh, under five millimeter text. The first thing I'm gonna tell you guys, under five millimeter text is you have to be super careful with your underlay. You do need some underlay. I like to see underlay to try and promote loft and lift things out of the surface of the, uh, of the material, especially because anything knit will have texture or grain to it. You still want underlay, but I used to like to run just a couple of passes of straight stitching underneath anything like that. Some people will use heavier underlay. Uh, sometimes you can do zigzags and heavy underlays underneath things, but then you need to back down your upper density. And that's the thing. You can increase your underlay and back down your top density. And sometimes that will help you to get a more continuous look where you don't end up with breaking and you don't end up with coverage issues or roughness. For me, what I like to do is still keep a pretty standard uh, density at the top, but I like to go ahead and run uh, unbroken runs of straight stitch underlay. And I sometimes do that manually on super tiny text. When we're getting under that five millimeter limit, I'm going to push that by making my underlay continuous. I don't do little pieces of underlay under each part of the letter. I usually do it under the entire letter if I have a good path from start to end to make that happen. And I'm gonna be really careful about using the longest stitches I can without letting them escape the column. Half the time when I see small, small lettering look terrible, a great deal of that is often because I've got underlay that people have used, they've used too much underlay or they've been told to use a ton of underlay and not very much top uh, coverage and they'll have underlay that comes popping out of the sides or it shifts because they've done the underlay in such a way that they're shifting before they get that top stitching done. On really small lettering, it's usually that someone has done say an edge run or a contour underlay and it's too close to the outside edges. They haven't run that. They try and use the same kind of spacing that they would use for say larger text or they use a lot of underlay where they literally, if you build up too much underlay, you'll actually build up a thickness. Think about this. If we go back up one direction, back down, we get about that, uh, you know, that 0.2, you have 0.2 mils per run. We have that 0.4 if we do run back. If we keep building up rows, even of straight stitching, we'll eventually meet the thickness of the column on our satin stitch. If we keep building up rows of underlay stitching until it gets to a certain thickness, because that, that thread does not sit on top of itself, it rolls off to the sides, we'll eventually make our underlay wider than the top stitching and it has to pop out to one side or the other. So using a ton of underlay is not a great plan, especially a lot of ton of straight stitching going back and forth, back and forth, especially if you say automatic branching. So you're not really watching how much traveling it's doing under a letter to get to all the pieces of the letter. That will cause issues. So super clean underlay, 
watch your densities and watch your holes. Open up your counters, drop your hooks. And that's something that I actually can talk about because we're talking about lettering here. Uh, little teeny tiny lettering, 60 weight thread helps a great deal. That is indeed a USB plug that's sitting over there. This is sub, uh, this is sub three mil lettering, I believe. It's a little bit under. Um, this lettering is done on, was essentially kind of a light sweater knit. We did use a water soluble topping on it, but that's 68, uh, 68 thread. And it does look great. You just have to make sure that your thicknesses of your satin stitches are enough to hold up. But as you can see on this, it wants to sink into that knit. A topping does help a great deal when you're dealing with knits or any of the texture. That really light sweater weight there, that stuff is almost the same as like a jersey knit, almost like a t-shirt. And it still looks like cable knit sweater when we're talking about something this small. Think about the texture you're working on when you do that stuff. And actually there's something else that uh, Ramona brought up that I think is actually useful. She was talking about columns earlier and I can bring back up the other image that I was dealing with before. She said, uh, when columns together and they're very, very wide, how do you decide where to split and where to cap wide? Like, how do you handle that? And this is probably the image we were talking about. I'll go ahead and bring that up. How do I decide where to split and where to cap? And here's the thing, for me, I'm looking for the longest stitch. And no matter what we're talking about, when we're talking about lettering of any kind, when we're digitizing our custom lettering, hand lettering, or digitizing for fonts, when we're thinking about our top recommended size and our bottom recommended size, we'll discuss that one more time before we're done here. Um, we're looking for the longest unbroken stitch, the shortest stitch, and we're looking for the smallest gap. These are the three things we're looking for to tell what we're going to do with the font, right? In this particular case, I'm looking at this W on the right-hand side, and if this was a really huge design, if it looks like it is here, it's really huge, I'm gonna look at this line. You can see it right here. This is the longest unbroken stitch we have. And if I'm getting that up above 10 mils, unless I'm doing something for it, now most of the time, I don't wanna run anything really wide like that unless I'm doing 3D foam. Really wide stitches, depending on your machine, especially if you're somebody using a prosumer machine or a home machine, they may treat those as trims and trim them out automatically without having a setting changed on your machine. Uh, and if you're even in the commercial world, you'll often have that really long ka-chunk stitch. We've talked about this before, that really long stitch where you're double cycling and it's like ka-chunk, 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 slows your machine down to a crawl. This kind of thing, if I see a really wide stitch like this, I am either going to do something to break it up like a random length limitation or something that's going to have a little bit of texture in there, or honestly, most of the time I'm gonna break it up in strokes. And where do I break that up? What I do is I look at the edges of the strokes that exist up to that point. And I imagine, if you see that my cursor moving here, I imagine drawing the edge of that stroke down and what it would look like if this stroke, if this width, was like the width of a pen. If I was using a wide pen and drawing down, I think about if that stroke continued in that same width, what would it look like as it went down? Or if it's something that's like a brush where I know there'd be a difference in thickness, I will artistically decide which stroke is on top. And then I will make sure that there's a good solid under uh, overlap between the bottom stroke and the top stroke. And the top stroke will run on top. Like I said, on this piece, if I'm imagining that I'm running, writing left to right, which with any sort of European English characters would be the case, I would imagine that this stroke on the left-hand side goes under, this one goes over it, this stroke now goes over that, and the final stroke goes up and over the last. So what I would do is make sure that this stroke here, I'm gonna draw that to the end here, and this one would go underneath. Same thing here, since this stroke is on top, I would make sure I would draw this edge over to here, and that's usually what I would do. Now, can you just divide the difference and go right up the middle? You absolutely can. I think that it looks way less artificial and much more artistic if we treat it as if we were drawing with a brush or a pen. And I think of it in strokes. It's why I'm always showing you guys this previous image, this one here. If I were using a more translucent ink to show you this, what you would see is the overlaps. And you could actually see which stroke was in order. Now in this particular stroke, we would not use this order the way that the uh, penman or pen, the person who did this work would do. The calligrapher would do this differently than we do because we're gonna draw this uh, center, we're gonna draw the crossbar first, then this left leg, then this tail, and then the right leg, because we're working from left to right. Now, we're not always going to be doing that, but we're going to assume that most of the time we're stitching uh, left to right, unless we're, of course, doing this for hats or caps. And even then, we often try to make it look left to right, because that's what our mind wants to see. We want to see strokes, especially in cursives. If you look, I've talked about script fonts before and how we achieve that. You want it to look like you're writing left to right when you're doing English or European characters. It makes the most sense. The thing is, when we want to break that up into strokes, 
that's what we're looking for. And for me, it's all about technically what's going to look the best. Am I going to get a loopy stroke? If it's too wide, is it going to run poorly? Or if I scale something up or down, especially when we're talking about making fonts that are going to scale or a logo that you expect to scale, I'm going to look at that longest stitch and say, how close am I to that kind of 10 millimeter border where I'm, I'm starting to not want to have a really long satin stitch like that, especially if we're talking about something that's going to be used in an industrial setting, if it's going to be used in any sort of way. Remember, these garments are going to be worn, long stitches snag, they get loopy, they get hooked on things and break. So I'm going to think about the utility of the garment and that's going to inform part of how I do it. I'm going to think about the usage. Like I said, if this were on, um, this were on a 3D foam on a hat that I know is not going to get wear on it, it's not going to rub against stuff and it's got 3D foam under it. So I want a really long stitch so I get that nice high crown. I'm going to use a much longer stitch. I'm going to use a wider stroke and I'm going to allow for much wider satin stitches. But in essence, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for that longest stitch. And the other thing is we talk about whether or not I have safe lettering here or what I might do to change lettering here when they're on the small end, I'm going to look for the smallest gap, the smallest hole that exists and the smallest stroke, the smallest stitch that exists. And that is both where I will decide what sizes are safe for a logo without alteration or whether safe for text without alteration. I would decide what the smallest allowable or smallest recommended text for, let's say a font that's going to be reusable in software is going to be. And that's also what I'm going to look at for editing if I'm forced to use a design at a certain size and I know that the text is not gonna run exactly the way I want it to. I'm gonna look at those smallest holes and the smallest gaps to try and get that safe distance. Like I said, 48 thread, 75, 11 needle. I want at least a 0.8 millimeter gap so that I know I'm going to see daylight. I'm going to see between those two satin stitches if I want to. If I want that hole to be clear on like a lowercase e, this is one of the places we see it all the time. I'm going to want to look for that hole. And honestly, I'm going to go ahead and show some, some more slides from that previous uh, piece here, guys, because I'd like to bring that up. Now, number one, can you go smaller? Absolutely, you can go smaller. And here's one of the smallest pieces I've got. I know people have seen this before if you've been on with me previously, but our known value, once again, thread weight, 75 weight thread, super small needle. You can get absolutely in, infinitely tiny text, really small text. Uh, we definitely have those sub uh, five millimeter levels here. The thing is that I'm using a really fine needle and we're on a fine grain material that looks like canvas there. And it is not, that is a lab coat. It is incredibly smooth. It does not look rough like that at all. We're just, we are absolutely zoomed into an incredible level here. The thing is those, the thread width, the needle and the texture of the garment are going to tell you what's up. They're gonna tell you what you can get away with. And testing, testing is the end all be all way to figure this out. But you know from what you're looking at, if we've got grain, if we have ribs in a knit and those ribs are a millimeter across that we know trying to have satin stitches that are a millimeter are very likely going to fall in if they hit wrong and they're not gonna look as good. They can get choppy. We'll use stabilizers like water soluble topping to kind of fight that. And we use underlay to fight that. But the likelihood is if we get too small on a textured garment, if we get really small, we know that we're underneath those levels that we need for the needle and the thread to kind of have that safe distance, then we know we're in the wrong, we're not gonna have a good time. So that's the thing. The digitizing concerns in general, no matter what kind of text you're talking about are the same. Whether we're talking about details in a design, we're talking about fonts, we're talking about lettering, when we're on the small end, we're always trying to get openness where we want it, and we also wanna get coverage and clean edges where we want them. And that's the thing, right? That's what we're looking for. Now, I will answer a couple things here too. Uh, this is absolutely true. Uh, Jeff Fuller says, recently saw this in a discussion, not all 40 weight runs like 40 weight, finish the thread can affect how it runs. Absolutely. Also remember guys, uh, 40 weight thread, if you weren't around for me to do the discussion on 40 weight thread before, um, thread weight is not a real measurement of thickness. It's a measurement of the weight of thread for a given length. And I may have said it backwards the way exactly that it's shown, but it's the it's the weight of a given length of thread. So if we have, you know, it's a, a thousand meters and how many grams it weighs is your thread weight. Well, the thing is you can have a thread that has a reason it's heavier. And I think that's probably why like a uh, matte finish thread, if you have matte finish polyester thread from Madeira, that stuff runs more like a 50 weight thread. We would expect the thickness to be more like a 50 weight thread. It's a little thin and the density has to be a little higher for it to run and cover the way we'd expect a 40 weight thread to go. Now it's called a 40 weight thread. The thing is it's not actually a measurement of the diameter of the thread that we're getting when we say 40 weight. So yeah, it runs thin. And I'll also say truthfully, if you have thread with a little bit more fuzz to it, spun polyester thread, spun polyester thread looks thicker because the fuzz on the outside of the thread causes more coverage because it blacks out. It, it 
blanks out. It covers the background behind it more because of that fuzz. It looks thicker. Uh, the core of the thread is not thicker, but the thread, because of the finish, does look thicker. And thick threads that have fuzz on them are going to cover more. Because what we're working at, we're talking about density. When we're talking about those little holes, what are we looking for? We're talking about coverage versus openness. Do we want a gap there or not? Do we want coverage there or do we want a gap there or not? That's what we're looking for. So when we're talking about openness, then the thickness of the thread, the finish of the thread absolutely makes a difference. Something that is smoother is going to definitely look thinner than something that is fuzzy, number one. Number two, some threads have specialty coatings, other things on them that may cause that weight not to mean the same thing as you would expect. So the best thing you can do is run a density chart where you run uh, different objects of a little bit of different density along on a panel and say, okay, at these different density levels, this is what this thread looks like when it covers or find somebody who's done it for you. I will say this, if you look up most of the thread manufacturers, they will actually often give you, if it's an embroidery thread manufacturer, they'll give you a target density for coverage. They will let you know what density you should expect to run for coverage. So that's one of those things that uh, we can certainly debate, but that is what we need to look for is coverage versus openness. Do we want gaps between the thread that are visible or do we not? Same with the satin stitches. Do we want gaps that are visible or not? Changes what those measurements are we can use and the thickness of the thread, the size of the needle are gonna change what is possible. Uh, Sylvia gives another question here that's interesting. Uh, for small lettering, is it recommended trim between the letters or not? Boy, have I gone the rounds with this one. Uh, I am the kind of person who does not trim between letters because of a couple of reasons. I don't trim between small letters if there's a very small gap. Usually you can do, uh, you can do an anchoring stitch where you stitch once inside of small gaps before you go over to the next letter, you do it manually. Uh, or there are some softwares that you can set that up. I know in Brilliance, we have the ability to run when jumps are small. Uh, you can actually do a small stitch in the middle and anchor that down and sink it into the fabric, especially if you have a knit fabric, something that's gonna have a little bit of a give to it. Uh, also for me, most of the time, I'm trying to get everybody to judge an embroidery at what I call the handshake distance, which is three feet away. If you're closer than three feet to someone who's wearing an embroidery, you're probably too close to them. Uh, that is the standard kind of, especially uh, it's the standard American distance for handshaking is right about three to four feet. And so that's one of those things that was actually done in the, I believe it was in the sixties, there was a, an entire, uh, study that was done on the distance of an American handshake. And so I always tell people handshake distance is where I want to judge something. If you're three feet away and you can't see those little gaps between there, why would we stop and trim? I'm a, as a production embroiderer, I'm somebody who wants to keep on running production. I don't want to stop and trim. It takes the most time and trims and color changes are where we will get threads pulling out, thread breaks, problems on the machine. It's much more likely than just continuing to run. So I tend to leave them in. Now, uh, you honestly, there are always going to be customers who do not like connector stitches and they're going to tell you they want them trimmed out. You can choose whether to do that manually and then you can do something like you can end a letter far away from the beginning of the next letter so you have a good manual trim that you can grab a hold of or you can let your machine do it. Uh, it takes more time, it's more effort and if I were doing it, I'd wanna tell my customer if they have a ton of little tiny trims that they're, uh, I would do a time study on that logo. I would probably charge them more based on the trimming because if we charge based on stitch count, everybody seems to be fine charging on stitch count. Well, imagine how many stitch cycles you lose on a trim and a jump. You need to time that stuff and know it. For us who are in the commercial part of the world, I would say, you know, tr trimming between the letters, I try not to if I think that it's going to look good enough without it. Uh, if it isn't going to look good enough from between words or I have a larger gap, I'm definitely going to trim between the letters. Uh, personally, in the shops that I ran, I preferred hand trimming and we would hand trim the things that we were going to have done because it was a cleaner trim and it didn't leave tails on the front. Whereas you're always gonna have some tails when you do uh, machine trimming that requires some cleanup after the fact. So if we were gonna do the cleanup after the fact, we preferred to do the hand trimming instead. So we would leave a jump attached and we would hand trim stuff that was clean and important. If we wanted it to look really good, hand trimming was the way. So the question there is, do you need to hand trim or do you need to trim between letters or not? That is up to you guys. That is something you need to know. So here's the thing. We're sitting here at about 43 minutes. I would like to show you a couple more lettering things, but I know we wanna talk ambigrams. So if anybody still wants to hang out and do ambigrams, I think I'm not gonna hang out too long on stitches. What I wanna go through, instead of just going through different stitch types, going through lettering again, stuff that we've covered before, I, I mean, I wanna cover some quartering. I'd like to cover a little bit about editing, a little bit about fonts, but not for very much longer because I really do wanna get into the ambigrams. People find that interesting. If you don't know what an ambigram is, we'll define that, but it's uh, essentially an artistic way of creating lettering, this is usually hand lettering because it's very bespoke, has to be, that reads differently depending on how you look at it. So we're going to get into that. I would like to jump through a couple more things on, you know, on what we were discussing before as far as lettering. And here's the thing. When we're talking about fonts, this is another thing. Fonts, digitizing for a bespoke logo, digitizing for a set of lettering that's going to be used at one size 
is very different than digitizing for fonts that are going to be reused. And the thing is, I have always been an advocate of digitizing whole fonts. If you can afford to, or let's say like you have Stitch Artist 3, you're one of the realest people, it comes with the top end. Uh, if you're using like Wilcom, you have to buy an extra unit that allows you to create fonts. If you have a big corporate client that does names that they want a specific font, I've had a great deal of luck of uh, making my own fonts for names or for corporate entities, for the divisions that go underneath their logo, I will make my own embroidery fonts so that I don't have to type things or continue digitizing things over and over and over again. And having that font means that they keep coming to me and kind of locks them in. It's been a real value add that I've been able to get working. The thing is that you actually have to think about how that font's going to be used. Because the things I just told you about, scale, right? And here's the thing, we have these things that we know, things that bother us with letters all the time. Like we have a, a uppercase A that gets too tight when we get really in small sizes. And so we end up having to drop our crossbar, right? This is something we do all the time to edit text, but here's the deal. If I now take this one that I've dropped the crossbar on, this is a classic way to deal with an A that's closing up and it's too small. We drop that crossbar down so that we get a little more gap in that thing and it looks great. The thing is, if I then blow this up, that, that version, if I blow it up, now I have something that doesn't look good at larger sizes. I actually have a, a defined size range that that font's going to work at. So but I digitize a corporate font, a custom font for a company, something that doesn't exist in my embroidery software or somebody else hasn't made, I have to think about the eventual end usage. And it means that I can't do the same kind of push compensation. I can't just shorten up those letters that have the open ends, like the A, the I, the anything that's going to have those open satin ends top and bottom, but I have to kind of pull back. So because I know that the satin stitch, as we know, pull is going to make it thinner, push is going to make it taller. I have to make sure that I do that at sizes. And the thing is, if I do a bunch of compensation, it's not going to work for a larger range of sizes because as I scale the letter up, we know the compensation stays the same. I only need, let's say 0.2 or 0.3, maybe it depends on how, what kind of fabric you're on, how much density you've got, like 0.2 millimeters of compensation for push at the top and bottom of this A right here at, at any size. So what that means is if I draw my character with shorter legs, for a small size, because you can, the little the little legs will lengthen. We all know they will, because that's why I say, don't worry about it looking like a triangle when you're in really small sizes, the legs will lengthen. The thing is, if that thing looks like a triangle and I've dropped that crossbar and I make it really big, it's only gonna lengthen by about the same amount in a larger size letter or a smaller size letter. So when we're working with a font we're going to reuse or lettering we're going to reuse at different sizes, we have to think about that and not compensate or make, make it work in such a way that we can use our software pull compensation to make the other letters that have the horizontals, like let's see the E or the B where we have horizontal satin stitches at the top and bottom, that we can compensate those out and meet in the middle. We can't always draw our, our strokes shorter because when we're talking about a font that's going to be reused at different sizes, that level of compensation is going to change. So it's something that I want to show you. Here's the thing. At small sizes, we're writing or drawing our own lettering, we're drawing our own shapes we're going to be able to do this kind of stuff. We can drop those. We can change these things. And that's a common culprit that I know I call it a common culprit here as a joke, but that is a common problem we have with small lettering. And the thing is, this is a lot of other things. We can also use a manual stitch across the bottom. What I'm going to say is that works really great at the smallest size lettering. But, uh, you know, we had uh, Ramona asking about super tiny lettering. Here's another trick. Crossbars are often done on incredibly small sub five millimeter, five millimeter lettering by jumping across with one stitch and jumping back again and getting a really narrow bar for crossbars. Doesn't work really great if you've got too much texture on your garment, but it does look nice and solid and at very small sizes, you can get away with it because the thickness of that double stitch or a couple of stitches across will be very similar to the thickness of the satin bars on the left and right. The thing is, it doesn't work all when you start to scale it up. So we're talking about, once again, fonts versus lettering. We have to treat lettering and fonts different because lettering that's in a logo with a known size, that's going to stay that size in our compensation and the assumptions we make about it get to stay the same. When we're talking about a font, we have to be careful about how we choose what where we have. Like I said, with those corners and with those overlaps, our longest stitch, our shortest stitch, and our smallest holes. We have to look at that because we have to then say, what can reasonably, how small can this reasonably go and look good and so correctly, how large can it reasonably go and not have stitches that are too long? Like so let's say we do caps on the top of things instead of actually doing a split. Let's say we cap a junction like we showed earlier. How long can it go before it gets loopy and weird? These are the ways we set 
for a font, what the upper register and the lower register of what we can do is. What's the upper size we can run, the utmost size, the largest size, what's the smallest size we can run? It's by those three critical measurements. The smallest hole, the smallest stitch, the longest stitch. These are going to be the three critical measurements we watch out for for those sizes. So that's what we're looking for when we're digitizing lettering. It's definitely what we're looking for when we're digitizing fonts and setting those sizes. But like we said, when we're talking about a known size, we can mess with it. These are the things we end up with. Super small lettering. We have the counters get too small. We have the hooks get too close to other strokes. And so we close up. The E looks like a tiny little round eight. The R and the P close up. We just drop those open. The thing is that's great when we're on a small size, not great at a large size. The good thing you can do if you're in software that has it, and I know uh, this is something we added recently for uh, Stitch Artists and for Imbrilliance, you can create size-based alternates and make a font that has alternate sizes where you drop the crossbar under a certain size. Wilcom has it too, lots of other software has it. I, I don't think they a lot of them have uh, style alternates. I think only we have stylistic alternates where you can do different styles of lettering and do the same thing. But these ones are specific. These ones you, you don't get to select specifically uh, in some software. Some softwares only do it under a certain size or over a certain size. Um, ours we can select individually and we can actually say use one or use the other. So it's more, you can do more stylistic fun stuff with it, but you can do that if you know what size you're going to be at. Some characters will run the same way, some will not. And actually, yeah, this is a, this is a great point. I'm gonna bring this in from Jeff since he gives me, this is a really great point. I like that he brought this up. Um, consistency matters too. The way you handle the caps on A, N, M, and W need to be the same. Absolutely. So it looks opt optically balanced. You see those with the R's where people handle the leg differently on each letter? Absolutely. And in fact, what I'd like to do is bring back up that article that I was showing you guys before. And this is what we're going to look at real briefly. This is the thing that we were talking about here. Um, that's why I don't like the way this is. You see how the M is different from the K on this one. Uh, you see how those M's have the horizontals. That looks weird and it's not what we want to see. And that's the same thing we're talking about with consistency. But here's the deal, guys. Ultimately, all I want to get across with lettering, and I'm going to jump into ambigrams after this and the rest of this and into bonus time is all ambigram time. But this is the thing. Number one, when we're talking about lettering versus fonts, when you have lettering in a logo, the chances are you do not need to look for a font for it all the time and the font may not match. When that happens, digitize the characters individually, break them up into individual strokes like I showed you earlier. Very much like you're drawing it with a pen, you want individual strokes, individual objects that are set and stitch objects, not one piece that has things automatically mapped. You want each stroke, each column to be separate and that's the way to handle it. Digitize it manually, work it from there. Worry about your sizing? Yes, you can. What are the known things we know? Our thread thickness matters, our needle size matters, and the texture of the garment matters. And the three things we're looking for to decide what's going to be the largest and the smallest we can run something safely, smallest gap, smallest stitch, and then the longest stitch. These are gonna set what the smallest and largest things we can do. And the thing is, even when we're looking at art saying, hey, can I get this art without changing it to be a certain size? That's what you're gonna wanna measure. Look for lettering, look for details where you have what's the smallest hole, the smallest gap that I have to maintain, whether it's a detail or it's a font or it's lettering, and what's the longest stitch that's gonna be there and how's that going to look or am I going to have to change something about it or change the stitch type that I use or the way that I execute to make it look right, to make it run right. Those are important. So with that guys, let's go to ambigrams. Okay, ambigrams are fine. I want to get into that. And I know that I spent a long time on text, but I wanted to make sure this is valuable to people who are coming for text and not just for designing ambigrams. First thing I'll do, I'm just going to show you guys one. This is the one that started everybody wanting to know more about what I was doing with ambigrams. An ambigram is a text or a lettering piece that reads differently depending on how you look at it or reads the same way from different angles. And this is the one that's probably the most famous of my ambigrams, and it's my name, the name Eric, right? And this is the patch. And here's the deal. It reads Eric rotationally the same up or down. Kind of fun, right? So no matter which way you rotate it, it still reads Eric. Now it's a trick of the mind to try and make you see characters in a certain way. As you can see how the R flips over and it becomes part of the H and the E crosses over into the R on the left-hand side, but that becomes the stroke of the H on the right-hand side. Uh, that's how we do it. You have to have a little bit of uh, ambiguity, right? So we ambi meaning like there's two, there's two ways to see this thing. Well, this ambigram, there's a little ambiguity as to which character is which and the shapes also reinforce that. So an ambigram 
This is particularly called a rotational ambigram. The types of ambigrams are various, but this is a rotational ambigram. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the types of ambigrams real quickly. Uh, by the way, Carolyn says, since we're talking about it directly, is that fill texture not a satin stitch? That is a satin stitch. That is a twist thread. So that is a twist thread that has a lighter and darker teal tone to it. That's why we have some uh, texture in there. So that's something else, guys. Thread can give you free texture. Those are normal satin stitches. It just happens to be in a twist thread. But let's talk about the types of ambigrams that are there. These are the kinds, and this is from the guy who really made them popular. John Langdon is the guy who really started these being popular. Uh, if you know of the book, The Da Vinci Code, there was a bunch of ambigrams used for that, and that stuff is done by Langdon. Uh, and ambigrams are different depending on the kind that they have. So rotational ambigrams, they read the same when you invert them 180 degrees. You can see this is the word energy here. And I actually have, there's a Wikipedia article that has ambigrams all about it. We can look at that here too. You see on the right hand side rotating there, it looks like it says ambigram both ways. That is a rotational ambigram. Those are the ones that I usually make. I make rotational ambigrams almost always. Uh, I don't really make any other kind. I just prefer rotational ones. The thing is that they can be both the same both directions or they can actually flip and have a different let word on the other side. So you can actually do it different ways. There's different ways to handle it. There are multiple uh, versions of the ambigram, uh, but I'd like to just show you some of the types here. So here's one that has two different words. It looks like ambigram on top, Wikipedia on the bottom, but it is actually the same characters inverted 180 degrees. So that's a rotational ambigram. I think that's pretty interesting. I kind of thought I'd show you that briefly. There are also um, mirror image ambigrams. A mirror image ambigram looks the same reflected right and left, or it looks different depending on how you reflect it. Usually it's just the same right and left. Uh, this is the word wiki in a, re in a reflectional a reflection amogram, mirror image amogram. Uh, and that's how that works. I don't usually make those. Like I said, I make rotational ones. Here's a rotational one where it looks like say in one direction. It looks like yes in the other direction. So that's another interesting way you can handle those. Uh, you know, I really do like them. They're fun. Here's another one where it's just, it actually has, um, it's a per perceptual shift amogram. If you kind of fuzz your eyes out, it looks like it says light is a wave. But if you look very carefully, it looks like it says light is a particle. Uh, that one's a little harder to get by, but it is another one of those ones that you can do where you actually use two types of words. And there's a ton of these kind of amograms that are out there. Um, and invariably, people can or can't see them. I know every time I show my wife, my wife says to me that she's like, she doesn't really do this stuff. For some reason for her, it's really hard to see them. And so when I try and like show them to her as a possibility of like, hey, does this thing look good? Is it turning out all right? She always just tells me she can't see them no matter who draws them. <laughs> so not everybody loves them, but a lot of clients do love them. I'm seeing a million tattoos done with this as well, by the way. So there's another one that says two in one, and that's another rotational ambigram just presented in a different way. And here's a couple different ones. There's another one here, uh, stay and hear. Same word done in two different directions. One of the things that makes this possible is using that uh, the cursive sort of S. The lowercase cursive S there is being used because it more closely matches the E in here. And a lot of these are done where one letter is one letter and that makes it a little easier to, or a little harder to do sometimes. But the thing is, you'll find that people do them the way that I did them. And the thing that I did for the Eric one, which you're actually gonna see is that the ER and the C that the stroke that is part of the R becomes part of the H on the other side, and it's not part of the E. One of those strokes that's in there uh, trades which letter it belongs to when you flip it. The left-hand stroke on the H, it trades off which letter it belongs to when you flip it. And the thing that's interesting about this one, in, for embroidery's sake, is that I've also paid attention to the order in which the strokes run, which is on top and which is underneath, so that when you flip it, as you can see, the H looks like this stroke was drawn last on top of both so that when you flip over it looks like it's on top of this stroke here and it still looks very much like it's left to right but if you look and see that i've cheated here the stroke that's on the r on this side you can actually see that it's underneath this stroke that would have been the h because it has to be the ch on the other side so i've also used the texture of embroidery when i'm digitizing these to try and trick your eye when you flip it over it's easier to see this as a ch because the, the end of this bottom curve here that you can see goes underneath what's eventually going to be the H. And so when you're reading it right to left, that join tricks your eye into believing the H is further forward. And then it doesn't look like it's part of the R anymore like it is on the other side. So I'm using the techniques in embroidery as well. The techniques we use to make lettering look good running left to right, right to left. I'm using those techniques to trick the eye a little bit more. And so it looks actually better in embroidery than it does in printing. And I actually have some examples that if I can bring those up, this is what it looked like drawn on screen, right? 
this is one of the ones that how it looked like on screen. So that's what it looked like when I drew it. I think it's actually less uh, fantastic on screen. Let me see if I can actually bring that up and get it full screen for you guys. I'm gonna bring that over. That popped up to the wrong screen for you. There we are. This is what it looks like full screen. And um, this I think is actually less effective by far uh, as it is in embroidery because in embroidery, uh, you actually get a lot more of the texture playing a part in how that turned out. So that's what we do for ambigrams. That's what they are at least. I'm gonna show you a little bit of how I do them in a second, but first let's just go through a couple more examples of ambigrams I have done. Um, by the way, people love these. Uh, if you do these for things like a cuff on a shirt, so it reads the same or reads something to the person who's who's looking at it, like you have a cuff on a shirt, it reads one way to you, but then a different way to the people seeing it in front of you. Or if you do these on the, uh, like say a hoodie, if you run on the edge of a hood, when the hood's up, it reads one way, and when it's back and on your back, it reads a different way or the same way. These are cool ways you can use it specifically with apparel that look nice, or when you have them on the arms of apparel, it's a lot easier for you to see both directions of the ambigram. But like I said, cuffs, uh, hoods, really awesome ways to handle that. And they look really cool. And uh, yeah, Carolyn says trim on a wool jacket. That's what Carolyn says as well. Yeah, trim pieces. Great to use these in band work and trim. Really cool ideas. Uh, but yeah, something interesting. Regina says she's working on an ambigram for her daughter's wedding. That's awesome. I love ambigrams. And I honestly, it's a really cool way to promote delight. This is something that I talked about Last week, we talked about adding value to your apparel, adding value to your designs, something that's going to bring people in and make them want to purchase, make them want to spend with you, or just make them interested in what you do and, and think highly of your skills. Things that bring delight, add value, make them value things more. This is delight. This is a discovery. People see it, and it's interesting. It's both, It could be, if they've never seen one before, it's novel, and it brings delight. It's something interesting. It's something you didn't expect. The unexpected, something ne interesting, neat, Nifty, unexpected is something that adds value to your work. And so showing people work like that is pretty interesting. And here's one of the other ones that I, I really enjoy. And this is the word stitches done in black letter. And it does the same thing. This is another one I designed that I really enjoy where you can see how the T, the decorative nature of the black letter makes the T and the C come out the same way. Plus the decorative line that we have uh, on the H allows me to play with whether or not that H looks like the H or part of the I in the next piece. So we actually end up being able to break the multiple strokes that are in this black letter. If you don't know black letter, that's the type of, uh, of uh, typeface we're looking for. We're talking about something manuscript-like where it's uh, Old English or German fraktur is another one that you, people may know. Feta fraktur is another one you've seen before, like a big bold fraktur font. Those are all black letter where they look like they've been done with a wide pen. And black letter is a classic way of handling ambigrams because the decorative strokes can be used to trick the eye into seeing different letters at different size, uh, different uh, orientations. So that's what we have there. Um, you know, I've always enjoyed doing those. So honestly, stitches is a good one because it really does read very uh, reliably both directions as stitches. The thing is, they're not always entirely reliable. Like I did one that I really liked that I did for um, a good friend of mine, Ron Goodwin, and his logo looks very loopy and very cursive-like. And this is the piece that I did for him. And I'm actually gonna try and bring this, bring it up uh, full screen. And it says Goodwin. Now I'm gonna say, if I don't tell you it says Goodwin, uh, it was a, a real stretch to try and make this I and look like a dot and an I, and then the, the little kind of serif on the back of that N and turn into the G. This one I think was not quite as uh, good as stitches in, in legibility, but it does show you what I was trying to do here. It does look like good wind both directions once you say it, but I think that you can see that I tried to use the capital D for good, but I used the lowercase I in win to try and kind of trick the I into seeing both. But truthfully, it's not quite as successful a, an ambigram as some of the other ones I've done. And I've done a lot of these for my friends. So I will go ahead and show you a couple more that I've done for friends here if I can get those together as well. And uh, like I said, I've did, I've did a couple of them for a good friend, Jerry Lee Medeiros, if you know her from the embroidery world. Uh, the one that I did with her for her first was this particular piece. And I'll bring this up full screen for you to see it. Uh, that's the piece that I did for her before. And I'll be honest with you, uh, this is a piece that I personally didn't like myself. I didn't like the look because I think that that first E with the kind of stroke on the top was not the best way to do that flip. I didn't like this one as much though. She likes the design a bit more than I do. Uh, and so I actually did another one uh, years later down the road when I, I came up with another idea of what I thought it should look like. So let's go ahead and open that up. And we can bring this one up. And I think this is a much more, like I said, they are of varying kind of success rates. And I think this one, once again, I've done that same similar trick. I'm using a lowercase cursive R 
to turn that into a capital L on the other side because we have a central spine of that I that's really hard to, to avoid. So Jera Lee here, I think it does work. I think it's uh, this one's pretty successful and it rotates pretty well. So I like that one quite a bit. And I've also done some that are a little more out there, a little more far-fetched that I can show you as well. But you know, that's that's one of the ones I think actually turned out quite well. Uh, and this is another one. I'm gonna go ahead and bring up my embroidery software so I can show you a couple different ones here. But here's another one that I did that I think turned out quite well. A good friend of mine uh, at the time, his name is Sorn Skald, S-O-R-N-S-K-A-L-D. And I'm actually going to zoom this in a little bit so you can see it. And this was an embroidery design I did for him some time ago, quite an old embroidery design. As you can see, S-O-R-N-S-K-A-L-D. Luckily, he has that central S that flips both directions. As you rotate it, it says Sorn Skald both directions, right? So the D becomes that S pretty readily and the O to the L. So I thought that was a pretty interesting one there too. And I, I like that quite a bit. So that's something that I, I like to do. Ambigrams, I think, are some way to kind of uh, work out things in your mind. When you have something bothering you, it's a great way to work on something that's a problem, but isn't an actual issue. It's not something hard for you to deal with. Uh, one last one here. This is another one done in a black letter, kind of tech black letter style. And uh, this one is Ashley. And it was another friend that I had in social media at the time. And so I do these a lot for people's birthdays. Uh, when, I do, when I'm having trouble working on something, sometimes I'll sketch these while I'm looking around. So that's, that's the thing with ambigrams. But here's the deal. I'm going to show you another one that I'm working on that I'm not entirely sure I'm done with yet and discuss it more in detail about how I actually do the work. Now, this is it. Here's the first sketch. The word illusion, and Carolyn will know this because she actually asked for this to be something I worked on. And the first thing I do is this. And by the way, because I, I draw ambigrams when I'm working on stuff or when I'm just kind of working and I'm looking for a way to kind of loosen up a little bit, you'll, you'll find that I can write upside down from right to left pretty easily because I do this often enough that it's been there. And this is the first step that I take. Honestly, I go ahead and grab the design and I just do this. I write it one direction. And if you're not me and you're not crazy and you're not writing from right to left upside down, just flip the paper and write it again like this. And I start to look at the different pairs that I have available. I look at the different pairs there. There's this US pair that's gonna cause me some issues. I'm looking at L's and O's and N's. And I start thinking, what shapes do I have on the top and bottom of this that can go together? And I start just trying to play and I just sketch. I sketch out different styles. I'm like, okay, can I go black letter style? Is there something there that can work? And I flip it over and I keep rotating paper. I find working on paper for this to be the best way to handle it. And honestly, I'm the kind of person who creates art before I digitize. A lot of people like to go into their software and digitize stuff straight away. Um, honestly, I'm a person who does design work and then I do digitizing work and I, I consider them to be separate work. Uh, I usually work outside in digitizing. Uh, you work in design software. I sketch first, I bring things in and then I do clean designs and then I go and work on other things from there. And so you'll see that I just start making shapes and I start looking at pairs and I start writing on things. And then I kind of get to where I start to figure out, I'm like, okay, if I use this kind of serif structure, maybe I can make this work. I can make the L into an O in this shape. I can, that S is kind of like a U. If the bowl of the U is a certain size, I can play with it. And I'll sketch and sketch and sketch until I kind of get where I want to go, right? That's usually what I'm doing when I do this. And then I'm going to go ahead and bring you back into uh, digitizing software. And we'll take a look at what I actually ended up with. And this is the piece that I currently have. Now, I'm not sure I love it yet. I'm not sure I'm done with it yet. But this is the piece that I've been working on so far. And what you can see is this, right? We have this this ILL, the L, yes, we have a big loopy L. It's because we're eventually going to use the loop that's in this L to make the O for the ON. So this is illusion. Now, is it the most wonderful transition? Not yet. I think that I might still have to work on this piece. I'm not entirely sure if I love it. But what you can see is that the serifed I pretty readily turns into the N. I think I may lengthen that left-hand serif over there. But the cool thing is that you can kind of loop this and run this through and it has kind of a cool angle and a kind of sway to it. And it would be a pretty cool border if you kind of put it all together. But here's the thing I was gonna show you guys is that as you work on this, once again, you're gonna work on your layering in a certain way. And this one, I actually ended up where I changed it from one side to the next. And you'll see that what I have here is essentially pretty standard text, right? There's nothing much that's that different about it. I just started working out my stitches in such a way where I kind of had these individual strokes. And like I showed you guys before, think about this as brush strokes. Even though I didn't do this properly with a brush, brush strokes often have a thin point to them and then they have a thicker stroke and they come back to a point. Well, this particular piece right here, I'm working as if it, are, it is brush stroke work, though I did do all of this in vector ahead of time. So this was all done in vector work before I did this. I had these individual strokes though. When I was building it, 
I built out these individual strokes and I rotated and played with them to make sure they were going to look the way I wanted to. So I actually worked on this first, building out half of it and looking at it, flipping it over and looking at what was going to happen with the different kind of conjunctions. And actually what you'll find the reason why I have like little points here, I have these serifs on everything, is that I'm trying to mask the transition from the flip. I'm trying to mask that I'm going to transition and flip over on the other side. And so when I started to work here, the other thing I'll say is often when I'm working in an ambigram for digitizing, Okay, we're back. Hopefully, if anybody's still back here, I will go ahead and finish up briefly with ambigrams. I think we might do another uh, show on this. I apologize for the issues we're having today. It looks like StreamYard is having issues with connections. I don't know why it's having those, but I'm going to go ahead and bring back my screen one more time, and let's finish the discussion on ambigrams. Sorry about that, folks, uh, but here's where we are. Um, essentially, we have these shapes that I was talking about before. What I would say is this, when I was working, if I was working on this at a larger scale, I might do in finished embroidery, I might actually cut these strokes apart. And what you're gonna see is that right now, uh, especially if I go ahead and drop out my images are here, I'm in Stitch Artist right now. You can see that I actually have full stitching covering underneath this other stroke here. That's something that I would probably cut back and I wouldn't have that, especially at larger versions of this piece. Uh, and you can also see I actually have a copy of this that I need to take out of that piece that I was copying and pasting and using things and moving things around. But what you're gonna see is that because I was going to change the sequence of which stroke was over or under, I actually decided to go ahead and digitize these as full strokes and then cut them apart after the fact. It's something I wouldn't do for lettering usually. I usually design outside of embroidery, as I said, but for this, because I wanted to decide which stroke would be on top after the fact, I actually digitized each stroke fully before I worked on it. And I'm glad I did because in this particular piece, I changed it up. And what I'll say is that as I was working on this piece, um, I discovered that I didn't like, I originally had all these serifs underneath this stroke, but it didn't make sense. It didn't look right. And I didn't like how these junctions were working out. And so eventually I ended up working them out in a different way. And you'll also see that I made changes um, in this S piece right here. If I go ahead and pull this off of here, what you're going to notice is that um, the S that's right there, it's not exactly the same as the eventual piece that I used. You'll see that, that, that I had some different styling in here and I actually had a spur that was coming off to the other side. It turned out to look a little too busy and it really didn't make that look like a U. And the thing is I'm trying to get a U with a loop over here so that this looks decorative on this side, but because you know what the word is when you go on the other side and we have this serif here, it looks a bit like a strange kind of Art Nouveau S. And what I kept thinking of about with this piece is I wanted it to look a little bit like a French Art Nouveau type. I wanted it to have kind of a swirly look. It made me think very much of like that metropolitan French Art Nouveau kind of style. And I tried to go there. If you look at like MUCA posters and stuff, I, I wanted some kind of uh, fantasy swirly looking type to go with this. Also because I'm trying to mask these shapes to look differently from one side to the other. And what I'll say is what we usually do, once we have this done, we'll start working on the pieces, seeing how they look, and then I will grab them and flip them. And you can actually very easily kind of see what this looks like. When you copy it and flip it, you'll see as I start to rotate it, and we'll go ahead and, let's do that again. Let's bring that out and we'll go ahead and rotate it. We can do it out here so it's easier to see. We start to rotate it and you see that we turn into that S-I-O-N. And the thing that's interesting about that is you can look how I have an I-L. Yes, that's a loopy L that looks maybe like a lowercase b a little bit. And I might have to work on that loop and see how much of that loop needs to curve back before it doesn't look like an O on the other side. But what you can see is I have this I-L that when you flip over, the part of the L becomes the leftmost stroke on the N and the loop becomes the O. So we end up with this U. Now the U is a little rough too, but because of the way the serifs are and the loop, it looks more like an S on this side with that serif hanging down the front part. Now I think that the US is probably the worst part of this one. The ON transition could be a little better too, but you'll see that the spur that's here, the fact that I have this little spur down here on that uh, L, that spur allows it to separate and look like the N on the other side. So like I said, I'm not gonna say I'm the best at this. I'm not even gonna say that I'm a particularly uh, gifted artist whatsoever. I think I'm a, I'm a fair designer who knows a little bit about type and I do, I do okay. But this is something I do for myself for fun. And I would just suggest everybody do that. And don't judge yourself too harshly. I know I sound like I'm uh, making excuses here. And I'll be honest, I find it's, it's hard. Showing you guys this right now, I'm showing you a piece that I'm not entirely happy with right now. But what I'm gonna say is when it's instructive, I think it's worthwhile to do. And that honestly, everybody should show their work as they're working on it. You should show and teach from the level that you're at. I think there's nothing wrong with that. And honestly, there are people who look at these pieces that I've done, including some of the ones I showed you, and they really love them. And uh, you know, I don't always. 
it's not always my uh, my judgment of what they're going to look like being great. And I've said over and over, my favorite pieces are definitely not other people's favorite pieces of embroidery. Um, invariably, if there's a piece that I love the most, it's a piece other people may not like. So that's just something I've always said. But here's the final piece. And what you're going to see is I think it's much more um, clean. I put it in a golden color so we can really get a look at it and get those shadows. I think having the serifs on the top of these letters was better. And actually, I'm going to have to go back because it looks like I've got one that I've missed here. But these things, I'm also branching them differently as they run, but they still look like the serifs are on top. And I'd say when I'm looking at this transition between the I and the N here, I think that that N looks much more reliably like an N flipped with the serif on top because it tricks the eye into saying, oh yeah, I drew a serif when I finished off the top of that end. And I think it looks much more like it should in that condition. So when I digitize, like I said, I do try and use the conventions of the embroidery to make it look better, to make it look more like what I want it to look like. And here's the thing, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this thing and we'll take a look at it and we'll rotate it in space so we can kind of say, okay, was it reliably good? Did it work out the way we wanted it to? We need to probably zoom out a little bit so we can see it moving as we rotate. But I think it does look like the word illusion. I feel pretty happy with it. I think that you can get a decent rotation out of it and you see the word illusion on both sides. I think the transition between the O and the N can be better. I think that that L on the left-hand side, I'm going to have to alter the loop. And we might have to do some of the things that I did in uh, the piece that I showed you with my name before to try and use decorative elements to help close the gap. And actually, I think I'll go ahead and go back and show you that again. The Eric piece has something very interesting going on with it in that on the flip on this other side, you get this subtle hint, and I'll show this to you again. You see that there's on the top of this piece, when we're looking at the serif that makes the top of the H here, it looks almost continuous with the loop that becomes the C. Even though we have this little spur that's up here on the upper left that's part that actually performs the leg of the R on the left side, because this looks continuous, it fools the eye, the negative shape that's here, the line that's here, makes you want to see the C when you flip. So it looks like you want to see that C there, even though on the left-hand side, it does look like a big open R, a big stylistic open R. And the same thing here too, this very much looks like to me, um, what I would call chinois, that kind of fake, uh, there was this whole like a fake sense of an, a design from the Orient uh, from a period of time, that kind of brush stroke is what I'm using here. And because of that visual language, the design of that, we get a more reliable, decent looking piece here. And I think that that is not only the case there, but it's the case when we're talking about the uh, stitches piece as well. The stitches abogram has a very similar look. And I would say that if we, if we check that out, and I'll go ahead and uh, pull that up again if I can, that, that that piece actually has a very similar look as well, where the stitches abogram uh, also is very much uh, based on the kind of type that it is, it actually has something going on with it because of that black letter. The black letter visual language, the strokes that are present there, the lines that are present there allow us to play a little bit more with what's going on. Because what we can see here, if, I, if you see on this left-hand side, this decorative straight line that is part of the T on this side, it actually becomes the right-hand side of the H. And if you look carefully, there really isn't enough stroke there for you to read that as an H with an E. That should be one letter. But the thing is the TI here, it switches sides. It becomes something else again. And you can see that we're getting that kind of look. You know, we're getting those two sides to cooperate. And that is part of the visual style that makes that happen. So the visual style makes the flip possible. So when you're thinking about making an ambigram for yourself, Think about the style of lettering. If we did this in Helvetica type, we'd be hard pressed to hide that flip. But using stylistic cues from a different type of typeface can help us make that happen. So like I said, brush stroke lettering that has ornate brush strokes is really great for that. Black letter like this that also has the uh, decorated illuminated caps, stuff like that really does help to hide that flip. And then for digitizing sake, like I said, Remember that we have that texture we can work with and that we're looking at whether or not we have that area that's flipped, whether or not we actually have that to work with, we can actually change how it looks. I mean, the Goodwin text here, you can't get that. But when we get over to this piece, you can see that the stitch angle gives you brighter and darker. We have a shadow and shine. We have, depending on the angle of the satins, we get different color cues. So things that look darker look like they're sitting further back. 
We have that H looks a little brighter. The central spine looks brighter. The serifs look brighter because of the vertical angle of the stitching compared to the light that we're looking at right now. And that the shadow and the shine and the layering can help us carry off that design. And honestly, are these hard to digitize? Absolutely not. This is easy stuff. This is text. It's all satin stitch text. You can either draw the shapes with any sort of vector tool you want, or honestly, most people are going to use left and right input sided input where you ladder step up and down with either curved or, uh, you know, cusps or nodes, other kinds of nodes to go up and down to get your curves. That's all you're going to do. It's not different than any other piece of text you're doing. The thought that's done ahead is honestly in the sketching. That's part of it. It's the sketching. It's the flipping and working on it in your mind. It's the deciding on the shapes and the things to think about when you're doing ambigrams like this. What, what I said previously, of course, the style of the lettering is going to make it more possible or less possible. So look at the style of the lettering and say, do I have serifs that I can work with? Do I have some loops or decorations that I can hide things in? Do I have lines or ornaments I can use? That's going to be something that's going to help with it. Look at the letters you're using. Honestly, there are some words that no matter how many times you flip them, they're not going to read the same both ways, or you're going to have to work on them differently. That's always the truth. So if you're looking at your first project, look at letters that when you flip them upside down are very similar or have some similar shapes in them. Write the two letter, the word on one side or the two words, if you're doing two words, write it one way, flip the paper, write it the other way. And then look at the shapes that are there. Can I take a stroke from the side of one letter and build it into the next letter when I flip? Can I take one stroke and make it trade from one letter to another if I'm careful with how they're put together? Uh, can I let them all overlap or maybe put gaps everywhere so that some of the gaps look like they belong, some don't? I could use a stencil style lettering and that stencil style lettering that has gaps in it because of the style of it that makes it look like a stencil, they won't judge the fact that that gap might also make a stroke jump back and forth between different words or different letters, different characters when you flip it over. So that's the ways to think about that, guys. And I think that honestly, it's something fun to do. It's something cool to offer. It's not something that's for everybody, but I think a lot of people really like to play with lettering and play with words. And because satin stitch lettering is just that essential embroidery thing that we do. It's something that we all do. I think that it's something that is very worth looking at. And if nothing else, look for these as something fun to digitize. If someone else is creating ambigrams and you can get some stock to, some stock art from them, or if you're making a piece for yourself that you're not selling, these are really fun to digitize. And it's a nice digitizing problem to think about pathing, to think about layers, to think about serifs and how things go together. And like I said, this is probably a part one of many I would like to go back and talk about serifs again. I'd like to go back and talk about tiny tags. I'd like to go back and talk about the way we do junctions in another uh, in another time. And I think we have done this before. We did an entire episode where I talked about junctions and lettering. And if you go back and look at that lettering episode, some of that is there. But I think this is an interesting way to have fun with it. And for those of us who are doing letters and names all the time, unless we're digitizing fonts for ourselves, uh, a lot of this really is just kind of grind work. It's work that we have to do, not work that's fun for us. I think that ambigrams are one of the fun ways to do it. And certainly, I also like just making cool textural pieces that are just text. This is one that's made from a really cool font from a guy called uh, Chank Diesel. And this is a design that I made myself. It's uh, It stands for... Uh, it's a, the term uh, Ars Langa uh, Vita Brevis, or Ars Langa Vita Brevis, which means uh, uh, the art or learning the art is long, but life is short. And I made a, a series of designs based on that. And I think that anytime you do some interesting treatments with type, it can help you kind of get more out of your lettering. And I'd say this is something to look at. This is, once again, despite the fact that it's a typeface, this is lettering, and the treatment that I did on it is idiosyncratic. It's something where you want, might not want to look for a font to make this happen because you couldn't make it happen in this particular way. The thing is, those passion projects like that really help you to refine your digitizing. And I also suggest you make fonts for yourself. Um, it's something that I like to do. If you see this piece here, this is a font that I made for myself. It's not for release. And in fact, I don't believe I can release this font. It was a, the original piece was done by a guy named uh, Hydro74, a really cool kind of street artist that was around for a long time, did some cool stuff. And I've made this font uh, from that type. Now, technically fonts aren't protected in the same way a lot of things are, but I think it is something you need to look at if you want to get uh, rights to do stuff like that. But I think that this is a really great way to hone your skill for lettering or text is to look at how you'd break up a font. And this particular piece, uh, I did bring it in with true type, but I didn't use the true type to make the actual strokes that I needed. Uh, as you can see, I've done these in individual strokes. You can see that I've got some uniformity to them. Uh, that honestly, I have done these different pieces in a way that makes them uniform. I have these strokes done the way they are. We have the corners that are built in the same way. You're going to see that the way that I treat the junctions is the same. I have full overlap junctions where we have that stroke, like I talked about before. 
And doing this for a font and getting internal consistency across an entire font is a great way to train yourself to do this on lettering. You can say to yourself, did I treat all of those junctions the same way? Did I treat all these corners the same way? Had I handled each of these letters in the same way? And when you do an entire font like this, I think it helps you to get that for even your other lettering projects. And you can see that you can work on making those different decisions based on how they're going to turn out for the particular font. And you'll see that some fonts have things that cause you exception where you have to change your assumptions. And I think making fonts for yourself, uh, either for clients, which is the best way, so you can have some uh, monetary gain based on it, or you can have them locked in, or for your own artistic, to scratch your own artistic itch, is a fantastic way to handle things. And I think the cool thing, that's why I like uh, Stitch Artist 3 allows me to publish these as object-based fonts I can now use in you know, typing envelopes and other stuff. I can now use them as a standard font. But it's something that I suggest everybody try at some point whether you're ever going to get into making fonts for sale or making them for yourself, making fonts or full sets of characters, it's a really great way to stretch yourself if you're working on lettering. And also you can do things like I talked about before. We can look at the size of this font and say, what's my longest stitch? On this piece, it's going to be in these long corners like that. I can measure my longest stitch and say, well, if my stitch right here is already at 8.4 millimeters, I'm not gonna be able to get much bigger than that and be happy with it. What's my smallest hole? Let's say it's here in the top of this B. Well, how much smaller can I run this design? Well, right now, if I look at my measurement on this, I've used my ruler tool. I'm at about 1.7 millimeters. Well, I can only go down about enough to get that 0.7 millimeters out of there before I get too small for uh, using this as small text. And I'll have to adjust that issue. Looking at those things in your own font can kind of release you from the pressure of doing it in someone's logo font or logo type. So it's something that I really enjoy doing. All right, with that, guys, we are fully into bonus time, and especially because we had some issues with the connection. Uh, everybody who hung out, I'm glad for you being here, and I appreciate that you hung out. Uh, I know this was a little bit of an odd episode. It had some different stuff in it, and I may do something different with it later. I think we're going to do a, a little more straight-laced piece that has more to do with small text at some point. Uh, very likely some pieces about executing text and honestly doing some work from, say, a true type and breaking it down, maybe even showing some uh, digitizing work, and I think that's something I might even do in a special session. But uh, for those of you who hung out, I think I'll just go ahead and cover the stuff one more time that we talked about before and wrap up everything that was in the episode today. Uh, first thing is lettering versus typefaces, lettering versus fonts. Uh, lettering is often done by hand, idiosyncratic. It can be hand done, hand drawn, or vector, or anything you want. But there's frankly a lot out there where you're going to find a logo type or a company logo or a mascot set or something for a team where the letters have been drawn, the individual glyphs have been drawn, and there isn't a font, isn't true type, isn't open type to get you through it. You're not going to be able to find something to replace. Don't spend an inordinate amount of time trying to replace it. Learn how to create satin stitch columns and how to break a letter up into individual columns. You'll be happy that you did. Uh, very frequently, I've seen people fighting for hours finding a font when they had four letters to digitize, five letters to digitize, and it would have taken them 15 minutes if they had just gone for it. And honestly, I think it's a great project for any of you who are just starting to digitize to take on a couple letters and try them out. I think it's a great way to do it. Remember the strokes. Look at it like you're drawing it with a pen. It'll help you to break it up. Break things into individual strokes, into individual shapes. Don't just use the outer shape of a true type font. Break that up into strokes and you'll be happy you did. Um, next thing is auto digitizing. If you are buying fonts, look for those things. That is where you see the breakdown. It doesn't know how to see the strokes that aren't really there, the lines that aren't there that we can imagine. As someone who's written with a pen, we can imagine those ourselves. Uh, we want internal consistency in our fonts, something Jeff brought up that was great. Look at the way you're treating the different corners. Look at your sizing and what do we use to establish what's going to work when we're looking at art and judging it. When a customer asks us how small a logo can go, how small text can go, when we're looking at how large something can go before we start changing it from satin stitch to something else, we're going to look at our smallest stitch, our smallest hole, our longest stitch, and we're going to estimate that based on also the limitations of the thread we're going to use. 48 thread, we're probably gonna try and keep a safe size of five millimeters, we can get smaller. 60 weight thread is about 25% smaller than that and we can get smaller again with 75 weight thread. Just remember that there is always an interaction between texture and the stitching on top of it. The texture of the material will interact. Uh, use support materials and think about that small needle when you're working on super textured garments. Uh, after that, we talked about quartering methods a little bit. It's all about that length. Remember the strokes, remember how to break things, those things apart. The difference between fonts and digitizing bespoke lettering for a logo. 
Uh, bespoke lettering for a logo will be compensated for the size that we're at. If we know that we're getting about 0.2 millimeters of push compensation at the top of an I when it's next to say a, a, a B where we have that horizontal satin that's gonna pull in and we have the top of that open satin that's gonna push out. Well, the top of that I, if we know that it has to be about 0.2 millimeters back and we know that that B has to be about 0.2 millimeters out, it has to be wider by 0.2 to pull in and that has to be 0.2 back to push out. That's the same when we scale it up, which means if we draw it with that compensation and then we scale up, that difference that we made for a small size might get much larger to large size and end up where we have some letters that are shorter or taller than they're supposed to be. So what we need to look at is compensation shouldn't be drawn in necessarily on a font that we're gonna use at a wide range of scales. And we might have to use our pull compensation settings or if we're working on software that does have push compensation, we can use settings to work it out. So we do our initial compensation perhaps on a, on a medium size, we can do a little bit of compensation, but we need to realize that as we scale up and scale down, that compensation may have to change and we may have to alter our font. And if we're making a font for reuse for other people to use, we may not want to use the same amount of compensation we would when we're working on bespoke lettering. Last thing was ambigrams. Hopefully ambigrams were fun for the people who got to hang out. I know some people didn't get to see it. I think I might even have to record a special little session to make up for that break that we had and uh, talk a little bit more about it. But ambigrams are fun. It's a nice project to take on to get you used to lettering and to play with. And also just get your head into a new headspace, kind of do something creative. Uh, draw your word one direction, flip the paper, draw it another direction, and look at for the points that are the same between the two. Look for the pairs that line up and work well and look for a lettering style that'll work to hide some of the flips that you do. Great ones, like I said, black letter is really great, and anything ornamental, anything swooshy where you have extra ornaments or decoration that can be interpreted as different letters when you flip it. So with that, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and call it for the take up today. It's been a little bit of a wacky ride, but hopefully the people who showed up, I hope you liked it. Uh, and if there's other stuff you'd like to see, I'll say this, there's a lot more. If you didn't like the Ambergram content, if you wanted more embroidery stuff, you wanted more technical stuff, go back into the ranks. There's another 31 episodes full of embroidery and business and e-commerce and tons of digitizing, tons of jargon and all sorts of technical content that's there to help you out. But if you have questions, if you have stuff you wanna see for the take up, go ahead and comment here go to ericcampbell.com and contact me there. And you'll find me here again next Friday in the wonderful and brilliant studios doing the same thing again. So if you have something you wanna talk about, by all means, comment. If you're catching this on the replay, comment anyway, and I would be happy to see you here next Friday.